Hi, I'm Jess Cagle, Editorial Director of People and Entertainment Weekly. We are very excited to share the following episode of the Jess Cagle interview shot live in front of a studio audience at Sirius XM's New York studio. Enjoy. Ladies and gentlemen, I am here with Sally Field and I could not be happier. Thank you. Thank you. Well, we're here today because Hello, My Name is Doris is, is out in theaters, and it's an incredibly special, sweet movie that I want, you to, I want you to describe. Obviously, Sally plays Doris, and what happens to Doris in this film? It's a comedy drama. You know, the, one of the hard things about this movie is you can't describe it. That's sort of the good thing, but it's, um, it's very, very unique. The character is unique. The story is unique in how it is told. It's about an older woman, obviously, who spent her entire life hiding away really taking care of her mother it was her choice but still she did it and um, at the beginning of the film she's she's got sort of borderline uh, personality issues having to do with is she um, got on the spectrum of hoarding or does she she has some she lives very much in a fantasy world that she creates um, for herself her mother passes away and it begins a change in her life. Um, she runs into a good-looking young man at the office that she works for. She's worked there forever, and um, she sees him and decides that's what she wants in her life, this, this young man. But it really is about this bait, this something that pulls you out of where you are and invites you to move on in your life. Um, that's the challenge for all of us as human beings. How do we move into the next chapter of our lives and stay open to who is next? Who will, who will I be next? What else will happen? Who else will I become? Or do we cling to the safety of what we once were? And it, 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 that's the bigger story. And it's really through Doris you know, deciding she's going to have this love experience. And it's almost like she's going through, because her life has kind of been on hold, she kind of embarks on a sort of adolescence. She, because she's been, let's say, retarded in her growth, um, she's emotionally sort of stunted in a way. I think she's had a probably very dominating mother. So her emotions just linger and stay dormant somewhere inside of her. Um, and when she decides to move on, you see her just take this burst and move forth in, in, in all the awkward, painful uh, newness that adolescence is. But every stage that we go through, and there isn't just one, it isn't just adolescence and then we're on the boat and we're in adults and we're on the ship out to sea. Every 10 years or so, there is a new stage in your life, whether it's young adulthood and then young parenthood and then middle age and then as your children are growing and leaving the house, each one of them offers you the opportunity to find who are you now? How do you incorporate all this new information, this new place into your being and own it, move into it, and now see what's left for you? So um, that's that's where that's where Doris is when when we meet her. And the movie has a has a great cast: Tyne Daly, Max Greenfield, Wendy McClendon Covey, Stephen Root, Natasha Lyonne. It's it's you're probably not going to find a film this year that has a better like cast of actors. Oh, it's just, just everyone is perfect. Cast. It's stupendous. Every little role is filled with with somebody terrific. Um, so that even the life at the office is is you know, elevated because of all of these, you know, highly comedic actors who are bringing every moment alive. And it was um, a very fast shoot, um, but a, a remarkable experience. Um, one of the things that will jump out at you is Doris's costumes <laughs> that you and Rebe Rebecca Gregg did together. Yes. Tell me a little bit about what you wanted to accomplish with, it was a weird a uh, hodgepodge mm. of, of stuff that says a lot about sort of her chaotic inner life. Yes. Well, she's uh, she doesn't have a lot of money, so it, and she keeps everything. She, fi she finds things on the street. She finds um, things in, in thrift shops, and she keeps everything, and, and she dresses in this bubble that she lives in. She lives in this sort of fantasy world, and she has no concept of, of style because she doesn't see the outside world, really. Um, and she doesn't see herself as the outside world looks at her. She just, 
you know, sort of plays dress up. Uh, and so her clothes are very eclectic and sort of people you might see somewhere in, in, in Brooklyn or, or in New York that, <laughs> that, have, that have their own sense of this is who I am. And um, Doris really treats all of the, the clothes as her, her friends because she's so um, isolated. And Rebecca and I, this wonderful costume designer, we had so little time and no money. She collected racks and racks and racks and racks and racks of clothes from the old uh, costume houses that are all going out of business, unfortunately. Mm. This Western costume in the Universal Wardrobe Department. They're all downsizing and these historic clothes are, are, are you know, being destroyed. We're all, all of them, them, those are all in, in Los Angeles. Yeah, they're all in yeah. Los Angeles. And we just started playing dress up. Um, not really knowing where the character was or how she dressed. Um, I knew what the hair was because I copied it from, that's actually Bridget Bardot, if you didn't recognize her. It's a Bridget <laughs> Bardot hairdo from 1951, except hers was blonde, obviously. Uh, and she put that big postiche, that fake poof of hair at the top, yeah, the yeah. curls that came down, and she tied a big scarf around it. But her bangs swoop to the side very in a very sexy way, and Doris cuts hers off way right at the numb, which makes it look <laughs> not quite right. not right. Quite right. <laughs> <laughs> um, you talked about Doris being at a crossroads, and I, I ran across something that you said a couple of years ago. I, I think it was to New York Magazine where you said, I'm starting on chapter one, page one of part three, Mm -hmm. of uh of the of of part three of my life mm -hmm. so i wanted to ask you or do you where are you in your life right now do you feel like you're I'm a, on a page bit at a 12. crossroads <laughs> 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 spending more time in new york yes I after am. decades of yes. you know, living in los angeles and raising a family of transitional stuff uh, i i was talking about when my mother passed away it it certainly offered me the challenge of are you going to just be what you were you gonna hang into the what that always was i was always there taking in los angeles taking care of children raising children and then taking care of my mother and so i sold my place and i had enough then to to get two little places one here in new york and one in los angeles where all my grandkids are so that's what I do now, and for the first time in, in my life, I have my first apartment in New York, like a kid, you know? I'm like, <laughs> I'm in- Do you feel like that girl? <laughs> yeah. Have I you talked like to I'm Marlo Thomas about that? I do, I do. I always wanted an apartment in New York, and, and I've had it for about four years now, and I still feel when I come there, it's my, it's my apartment in New York. I have a little apartment in New York, oh my gosh. Uh, New York apartments are a lot smaller than space you get in LA. Did you notice that? Uh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, my 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 bathroom is is the size uh, is smaller than my closet in 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 LA, but that's all right. I like my little bathroom in in New York because it's my New York bathroom. It works just dandy. Um, I wanted to ask you, Sally, about um, about about some of your films. Yes. Because we love a lot of them. And number one, I want to ask you. I'm not going to ask you what your favorite film of yours is because I'm sure that's impossible. However. However, if you had to go home tonight and watch one of your movies, oh dear God, which one would you choose? <laughs> They're Is all on I... DVD. You're gonna pick one of them. Why? But what if you had me over and I begged to watch one of your films? <laughs> I would think you were really odd. <laughs> <laughs> like really? That's what you want to do? We could do I anything, would think that and you want to watch? Very, very strange. Forrest I think Gump? the only way I might ever do that is if I wanted to show something to. Well, like right now, like one of my granddaughters, for instance, because they're older and there's some, you know, I, I, I don't know how much any of my grandchildren have ever seen any of my work. I know my sons haven't seen all of it. I think there's some things I'd like to show them, truthfully. <laughs> so it might come down to that. Uh, um, but I, I think I'm finding that I have a granddaughter who's 18 and a granddaughter who's just turning 15. I, I'm realizing there's some things I would like to show them. Just, just them. Anything particular? Oh, I, you know what? The first thing that comes to mind is I'd like to show them Sybil that I showed that I did so long oh, ago. Oh yeah, um, and it's very and it's and it's very old. But I, I I just I don't know. I don't know why. I just would like them to see it. There's also Norma Ray. Oh, right yeah. for like, but but yeah. for young women or yeah. young men. I mean, yeah. that's a very. Well, that, I, I that would had certainly a big ask them me. if they'd seen that, and I don't. I doubt that they have. Um, your parents, your parents divorced very young. You had a complicated relationship with your stepfather. Um, what what impact do you think 
your upbringing had on your life and your decision to become an actor? Oh, of course. You know, all, all, it had all of that. Um, my childhood had a great deal to do with who I am. You know, that, that's the way it is. Um, and all our lives, we're trying to sort the pieces and put them together of, of what childhood was. Nobody doesn't do that. And those who don't do it should. Those who don't do it are the ones that really need to do it. Uh, all of that uh, it has greatly influenced uh, what, how I chose to live my life and still do. What kind of role did it play? What did you get out of acting that, that gave you something at a very young age? Well, because I was raised in the 50s, um, and I was, you know, I lived in an environment, as, as a lot of you women here will know, where, where emotions and, and all the colors that women are were really not allowed in, at, at the dinner table or in the living room or anywhere. You know, you had, you know, there was a, t there was a very tight parameter you had to live within of what, how you dressed and how you sat and who you were and, you know, of decorum or, or words you said or, or, or emotions that you had. And... I was a very emotional creature, and I, I was so cut off from the core of me because I couldn't be that. And I came, my, my uh, grandmother and her sisters who helped raise me, I was very close to them. They were from the deep south. And, and if I got angry as a child, when your brother hit you and you get angry and you, and, and my grandmother would say, don't be ugly. And and so that's you know that was a that was a a, a comment on on anger that that if you're angry you're ugly. Mm -hmm. So when I got on stage, it was the only time I felt all the pieces could come together, because I was on stage, and not that they weren't me. The point was is that they were me. It wasn't that I was being somebody else. It was that I'm finally me, and I could be angry, and I could be mean, and I could be all of the colors that were simply not acceptable. And then I said, could say, oh, gosh, well, I don't know what happened to that one. <laughs> <You know? laughs> gosh, like, I know I hit out. you really hard in the arm. I just I don't know what came over me. you know. And it was the only time I felt that I was centered in, in who, who I am. When you got the role in 1965, you got the role of Gidget, then right after that, The Flying Nun, you were very young. Mm -hmm. What did the sudden fame, how did you handle the sudden fame that came along with those two roles? I, I hardly noticed it. Because you were just on the set working? And yeah, that, that is part of it. Um, and I think just the nature of who I was at the time and probably still have a mechanism that that I never read any reviews. I never I never saw like Gidget or or even the Flying Nun is I never saw it as being a product. I, I, I just saw it as being, oh boy, all these days on the set and I just oh boy, oh boy. <laughs> um, and and all that I was learning, all that was I was absorbing and drinking in and and um, the camaraderie and learning what a set was and the crew was. And um, I never thought of it as being a product. I mean, that it went on the air was almost like, it goes on the air? Um, right. I, the joy of it, the, 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 the real meat of it was, the, was that I got to do that uh, uh, and learn that kind of work. And I, I also a big turning point is that the, uh, beginning of the, the very end of the second year, the nun, and the, before the third even began, I was pregnant with my first child. And so that, all my focus is somewhere else, you right. know, barely noticing. I do my work, okay, but my life was, was happening beside itself, you know, and my focus was on what was happening inside of me. After those were over, you came to probably the first big crossroads in your career, which is you had to, you knew what you wanted to do, and you knew that you could not be typecast mm -hmm. in those kinds of roles anymore. So what did you do to make sure that that didn't happen to you, That other, to make sure other opportunities came your way? Well, it was very, very difficult. It was the first of, of you know, many, many struggles. If, if you don't love struggle, don't get into this business. But... Um, in those days, and that was in, still in uh, that now it's like the early 70s, um, 
television and film did not go together. Film did did not want anything to do with people who had come out of situation comedy television, especially females. Um, and and in reality, it, that would have probably included males had any men really done situational comedy television. They hadn't been a lot of them. It was mostly where women um, did their work. And the men that had transitioned from television, being television stars to film, were like James Garner and Steve McQueen and Clint Eastwood. But they were men. And they were they came out of big uh, Western hour long, much more prestigious um, kind of shows. So you couldn't, it wasn't that you couldn't um, you know, past the audition, you couldn't get in the room. You couldn't get on the list. I couldn't mm. get on the list to be included in a list of actors that could p- potentially be right for this role. So instead of turning it inward on myself, which I could have done and been bitter and begin to drink and take drugs and, and, <laughs> and want to hurt people and um, myself, and I, 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 I like that that was a viable option. That was a though. viable. It's all. It is always a viable. Option. You're right. It is. <laughs> <laughs> not the best decision, not but it's the, there. Not the best, but I think about it now and then. Um, it, it, if I wasn't where I wanted to be, I wasn't good enough. And luckily, when I was doing The Flying Nun, Madeline Sherwood, who played the Mother Superior, did a wonderful, wonderful thing. And that is she took me to the actor studio in Los Angeles, and I met Lee Strasberg. And I began to work with him constantly. So even though I was working in The Flying Nun in the day, I was working at the actor studio at night. And that stayed this, I mm. continued to do that. Um, and I, I felt in my head that um, when I was ready, something would happen. And of course, when I was ready, something would happen, but I'd still have to like kill myself to, to get it, um, to, to land it, so to speak. And eventually I did. And it was a, a film in 1975, six, something like that, Stay Hungry, mm-hmm. which was directed by Bob Riffleson with Jeff Bridges and Arnold Schwarzenegger. And um, I I knew by then that I was not going to be hired um, because they thought I could act the role, portray the character. I would only be hired if they thought I actually was the character. And so uh, the acting performance on to even after even get being allowed in the room once I got into the room. Even though no one still wanted me in the room, I could hear them saying, "Why are you wanting to waste my time?" I could hear it in the other room going on over there, you know. Um, but I knew how to use that kind of energy by then, and um, they had to think, "Boy, this is Sally Field. Uh, she was Gidget. Boy, that was one heck of an acting job because this little floozy sure." <laughs> <You know? laughs> Um, Did they actually use the word floozy? No, that was my term. I think they use all sorts of other things that were much less acceptable. Um, so I had to I had to convince them in in two specific cases that I that they weren't hiring me to play the role. They were hiring me because I was the role. So what was the role in Stay Hungry? It was a floozy. <laughs> you know, it was a little, it was a little kind of, uh, you know, sleep around girl, a little, a little um, kind of a sex pot sleep around girl. So that was, it was hard for them to wrap their brains around mm-hmm. that they were going to hire me to, to do it. So how did you get the role in Sybil? How did that part? They come had to, to you? think I was mentally deranged. Uh-huh. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Which they, you know, I had to be so uh, right for it that they couldn't say no even though every bone in their bodies wanted to say no and bob riffleson would say that to me you know i want to say no i really want to move away from you i don't want to hire someone who played the fine nun i mean he said that which is very honest of him and um, did audition 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 until i got to do the final audition which was with joanne woodward and um, who is the most magnificent soul and actor. And um, after that audition, she said to them, either it's Sally Field or find another Dr. Wilbur. And that was the character she played. And um, I, I, so they hired Sally Field. That and was... That was me. <laughs> <laughs> Smokey and the Bandit. Mm-hmm. Now that was the first 
sort of, that was your first, if I'm not mistaken, first big box office yes. hit, uh -huh. right? Uh -huh. Did you know Burt Reynolds before, or is that the movie no. that you met him on? Yes, he, he called. It was, I mean, literally, we had just wrapped Sybil, which was a, a you know, longer shoot because it was um, two consecutive nights, so it was four hours, and we just wrapped Sybil. I was sort of dragging myself around in some, you know, coma of, like, emotional um <laughs> dither um and and i didn't know him and he called and said i'm we're going to send you this script but before you read it i just want you to know the script is terrible but <laughs> um but we could make it something we could we could you know you know if we really like improv it and just blah 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 and i i he was right the script was terrible it was just there was <laughs> there was no script whatsoever and um but it would put me back in the arena, a film that I had worked so hard to get to. I'd only done Stay Hungry. Then I'd done Sybil, which was back on television. I just finished it, so I had no idea what Sybil was going to be. Um, and I thought, well, it would get me back on the big screen. And Bert was the most popular actor at the time. And I thought, well, I'm, I, I'll be starring opposite him. So if it really bombs, I'll blame him <laughs> <laughs> and not me. I'll just be, you know, oops, what can you do? Um, so it was just a risk. You just sometimes take a, take a risk. And I did. And what was it what do you remember about making? I don't know. When I remember going. I remember going to see that movie when, in you know, when it came out, and thinking, making a movie like that's probably got to be the most fun thing uh -huh. imaginable. Also, because you were clearly having to improv a lot of the script. And yeah, stuff. we just sort of made it up as we went along, um, and and it was Jackie Gleason, and it was you know everybody else that was in it was. Just, even though I I was I only I was only there with Bird, and I wasn't I didn't do anything with Jackie Gleason, which I feel you know, bereft about. I would have liked to have had a moment with the great Jackie Gleason. Um, it was great fun, and it was a, another a fast shoot, um, and 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 just it was fun. But you still were like, is this a movie? I mean, is, are we doing this? Is this like, is there something going to happen at the end of this? And they put it out, you know, because we didn't see the stunts. Right. We didn't right. see how shooting the stunts. We saw a few. But we would shoot, you know, like part of the day and thank you so much. And then they would go and crash into each other. And we never, you know, I never saw any of that. I, I don't know whether Bert did. I, he might have like done, you know, been more a part of that. Um, and then it just, it just, it was a bubble in time. It just caught something in the, in the country at, at the time. And who knew? And are you and are you and Bert still friends? Um, we don't really talk to each other. No, these he, he have... often says he like you're the one that got away. He loves to say that. I well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> After that, or you know, maybe not immediately, but Norma Ray, 1979, mm -hmm. and that was there was something in Sally Field as Norma Ray that none of us had seen, mm -hmm. even despite Sybil and, and and a kind of variety of work that you'd done. We had never seen the anger that you mentioned earlier, mm -hmm. this kind of fury that you were capable of doing that to an audience is just, you feel it viscerally, mm -hmm. this anger. Um, tell me a little bit about finding that character, Norma Ray. Well, it just, it was, you know, a gift. It, it, it was the first one I didn't have to fight for, but somebody fought for. Um, Marty Ritt asked me to come in, the director, the magnificent man who became a big, big part of my life, a, you know, a huge, important part of my life. Um, he asked me to come in. He said, uh, and I, man, I got asked in on a meeting, how, how novel. Um, and he said, look, the studio doesn't want you. Um, we offered this to, you know, they, he named all, about five other actresses, all the, you know, big stars of the time. I love that you kept going in for these meetings I and know. were like, we don't want to hire don't you. Like Nobody you. wants you. We don't want anything to do with you. And I would say, well, just sit down and wait. You'll change your mind. Um, but he said they don't want you. Um, and they offered it to everyone else. And luckily they turned it down because I want you and I will fight for you and I will win. And he did. And that was the first time, you know, that anyone went to bat for me, uh, that I wasn't out there batting for myself. And uh, 
it certainly was a just a remarkable um, experience to to be with him and to um, be in her shoes and uh, it was really it was the first film I had starred in so it was really kind of the beginning uh, of my of my film career even though I had done Smoking the Bandit and uh, Stay Hungry before that and and years before that I did another film between Gidget and the Flying Nun called The Way West but none of that um, you know it really really tapped in or began to be the work that I had studied so hard, the work that I knew I was capable of doing by then. Um, and this just offered me an opportunity to finally do my work. Why do you think you, as an actress, are capable of that kind of fury and anger that comes through in, in certain performances? Um, well, actors just call on who they are. You know, Why uh, are you so angry, Sally Field? You will. <laughs> uh, there's a lot of reasons. Um, but y I think different actors work different ways. Uh, I Because I studied with Lee and come from the actor's studio, I am like completely a, a method actor, even though that's gotten such a bad rap because mostly no one would ever know how I was working and I don't you know go around announcing it or or you know I just walk around and mumble to myself and um but I I call on all the things the craft that I've learned to do which which is a whole lot of things a lot of pieces of finding pieces of me and um uh, and other things that are outside of it of of um of how you of how you build a character now we have come to the moment of Steel Magnolias. <laughs> <laughs> I think I know the answer, but I wanted to ask you, when it's on television, do you stop and watch it like every other person in, on the planet? <laughs> no. Uh, no. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but speaking of anger, we have, a, um, we have a little snippet from Steel Magnolias. I don't think I can take this. I don't think I can take this. I just want to hit somebody till they feel as bad as I do. I just want to hit something. I want to hit it hard. <laughs> Here. Hit this. Go ahead, Malin. Slop her. Are you crazy? Hit her. Are you high, Clary? Clary, have you lost your mind? We'll sell T-shirts saying I slapped Weezer Boudreau. <laughs> just, I'm sorry. Just one of the great scenes. <laughs> Earlier, we were we were we were cutting that down because we had like we had like 90 minutes of it, but like, which is why we chose a we chose a snippet that actually you were barely in. But anyway, yeah, it was a like fantastic it. moment. Um, back to television on Brothers and Sisters mm -hmm. um, was another iconic role because I think all of us wanted somebody like Nora. Those of us who are adult children and have our parents, we want a mom like Nora Walker. And I think that was a huge key to the success of that series. Mm -hmm. um, what what kind of relationship? You have three grown sons. Mm -hmm. What kind of relationship do you have with your sons? Pretty much what you saw. <laughs> <laughs> so close. Uh, I kind of uh, was able to bring a lot of my own life and my own relationship with my my children on on into that show. Um, it, it was very much. And and for me, that was why I wanted to do it, because I never I, I was longing to see any life of, of, of older women. And I was getting older. Certainly by then I turned I remember I turned 60 on on the show. Mm -hmm. So it was like that was 10 years ago. Um, and w where was I ever to look? How how to how were women to age and move on in their lives? And how what was their what were their lives about now? And so when I saw this, it was it, it, at the beginning of it, at least maybe going to be I could find a way that it would be similar to some of the issues that I was dealing with and ultimately it was and and I guess I issues that uh that women my age are dealing with they're they're grown-up children and staying in their lives and trying to find your own existence within it and the grandchildren entering now and your children are always always your children always your children when do you stop worrying about them uh, when you say goodbye and quit breathing, I don't know. <laughs> when it's all over, I don't know that you ever, ever. You know, there's the saying: you're only as happy as your unhappiest child. 
And it's completely true. I would just long for a time when they're all happy. Couldn't you all be happy at the same time, guys? <laughs> A couple of years ago, you wrote uh, an open letter for the human rights campaign to support mm -hmm. your son Sam, um, who's gay. And you, it, it, it was a, it was a letter talking about having a gay son and encouraging other people to speak out. Well, I also spoke at the at the HRC at the at the dinner, and Sam introduced me. And if you haven't seen it, I really want you to see it for no other reason but to see him because his journey was hard, and he. He was the shyest kid alive, and almost until that moment. And I was about to have a heart attack back there, thinking he'd. And he walked out there and like owned it, and and it was his beginning of, of really owning himself. And I uh, talked about uh, the letter that I eventually wrote to that would would go out and cover more than than saw it at the um, dinner that night for the HRC. What advice do you have for parents who have a child coming out or you think they're about to come out? Well, first of all, don't don't be frightened, don't don't and don't put your own um prejudices about or fears about sexuality, your own fears about sexuality on on your children. Um sexuality is 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 a human glorious part of existence and in, in Sam's case, certainly, nature told him what to be, and it wasn't something he looked to be, and he found it difficult to grapple with what nature had said, this is what you are. And um, I, I welcomed him to welcome himself um, and find um, that part of his life and, and to the relationship he will eventually have and children he will eventually have. And... Um, what horrifies me is that is that there are parents who so disapprove, who are so brainwashed to think that, that this is something, you know, out of the Bible or ungodly or, you know, against nature. Uh-uh. Uh-uh. Nature. <laughs> if not against nature, if nature has actually done this. Sam was always Sam, this wonderful human that he is from the time he was born. Um, and... The, some people, you know, actually shut their children out of out of the house when they're young, they're teenagers. They're, you know, they they're having a hard enough time trying to be teenagers and own any part of sexuality. I I'm still trying to figure it out. <laughs> I was like, is it really? Is this you know? Um, it, why is it? It's it's, a speci it's specifically difficult in this country, you know, because we come from such a puritanical foundation uh and it, and it gets handed down and handed down and handed down um these terrible phobias and prejudices and 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 an and inability to welcome our own sexuality uh into our lives it's all just like oh oh <laughs> yeah and and on that note <laughs> <laughs> Sally, we have come to the moment in in the interview that is known as the Kegel exercise. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Well, we all we all had to do that when we did natural childbirth, and we you know we were all we were all studying to do Lamaze, and boy, oh boy, you saw all the women at the lights when they were stopping their car at the lights going. <laughs> If you're listening, we will have I'm that on video your somewhere. Face. <laughs> we'll give you a URL soon enough. This is fill okay, in the blank. Fill in the blank. Right? Close friends describe me as blank. Hard to find. <laughs> Strangers describe me as friendly. Only I know that I am neither of those things. <laughs> My last meal would be what, and I would eat it with who? My last meal would be a huge bowl of pasta, and I'd eat it with all my children and their children. The song that always makes me dance is? Anything Aretha Franklin, I think. The movie I've seen the most times is? Not that I've wanted to see it this the most times, but it's just always on, which would have to be Casablanca. And like, come on, people. Come I love on. the movie, but stop. <laughs> <laughs> the book I would take to a desert island. Ooh, 
I don't know. I guess War and Peace because I haven't read it, and it, that'll take me a long It'll time. Take a long time. <laughs> that'll last. It may be heresy, but blank is overrated. Donald Trump. <laughs> <laughs> I feel sexiest when I am. <laughs> I almost said the most bizarre. I almost said alone. <laughs> I thought, well, no, I can't say that. That's, I can't. <laughs> you can say that. Well, that was the first thought I had, and now I think I'm really, really twisted. I was, the, I was talking about healthy sexuality before, and I'm not. You know, I feel. I feel. Uh, you know. When I'm around somebody who's who I think is 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 attractive, who thinks I'm attractive, but that hasn't been for a while, so I think I'd have to say alone. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't be caught dead in a bikini. My greatest extravagance is. Hmm. Well, I think it's probably my grandchildren, but then again, it might just be books. That sounds odd. <laughs> The thing about myself I've learned to love is my thighs. <laughs> <laughs> the I'm, teacher. I'm working on it actually. Yeah. The the teacher I'm most grateful for is oh, my Mr. Culp at the at Birmingham High School. He was my uh, drama teacher in the in the drama department for many years. What did he do for you? Well. He he did a lot. He let me just go. And one time, I think I was in the 11th grade, and he called me in, and I thought he was going to, you know, we were going to talk about the next term play or what scenes we were going to do. And now I was going to say, well, let's do it in the round, or I want to do children's theater. And he called me in really to tell me, asked me if I would please be nicer to the other students. <laughs> <laughs> because I was so, I had gotten so aggressive. I wanted, I was so hungry to know things and do things. And I, and many of them didn't take it as seriously as I did. So I'm sorry, you can't be in a scene with me because I'm afraid you won't remember your lines. So I would like, I would find ways to do monologues out of, out of three character plays. I would cut out all the other characters. <laughs> I love the smell of coffee. I hate the smell of. Really? You want to go there? <laughs> <laughs> uh, perfume. I'm not a big perfume lover. As a child, I dreamed of becoming... I, what I am, I guess. I, I, I dreamt of, of, of becoming an actor, and um, I guess that's what I did. I can sum up my life in this hashtag. Oh, my. War. I can sum up this life... In I, I don't know. I, can't, I don't like to sum up my life. That sounds like the end. There's a quote. It's never too late to be what you might have been. And I hope I'm always finding the places in myself that might have been. That is the end of the Kegel exercise. Not the end of your life. And Sally Field, my, hello, my name is Doris, is out in theaters right now. And I want to thank you so much for giving us your time today and, and all of your answers to my stupid thank questions. You. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.